On this episode of A Bird's Eye View, we're gonna talk about optimizing EV infrastructure. I'm Brad Bochamp, EV segment leader at Bluebird. Today, I have Stephen Koskaletis from Polara here. He's the vice president of the Gross and Strategy. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me. We've got a lot of people that have gotten started down that EV journey. They got their original infrastructure installed, and they've got their buses running routes out there, the contractors and the, and the school transportation officials and districts. Uh, that Now they're starting to ask us about optimizing. What do I do to make that even better? You know, So everybody's used to gas and diesel, right? You go to a gas and diesel station, you fill the vehicle. Really not much you have to think about. But there uh, is a lot of different ways that you can actually, in this EV world, make it better not only than gas or diesel, but just make it better in the own system you have. So I kind of want to touch on that. What kind of things are you hearing or seeing out there uh, that di districts could actually do or contractors could do to optimize on their EV infrastructure? Yeah, the topic is very broad because every utility across the United States and Canada operate in slightly different ways. Generally the same because there is a consensus, I would say, in, in, in how to deliver power, but uh, rates change. Rates change, and even within the rate, you've got something that you call, you know, base rate, and then there's the the demand charges on top of that, um, and and even throughout the day, depending on the energy consumption of the the area that you're in, the the dollar value changes as well. So these are all things that we have to consider when we're comparing, let's say, apples to apples with, uh, like, let's say, the price of gas compared to the price of fueling an electric vehicle fueling. Yeah. So. What you're saying is, I go to buy bulk fuel, I'm going to pay a given price, it's going to be in there. But in this electric world, I have some flexibility on what I'm paying and what time of the day, uh, even probably some seasonality, I would imagine, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so what types of additional infrastructure or pieces would go along so that I could be able to take full advantage of either the lowest rates or being able to uh, charge my vehicles to cost me less uh, per kilometer or mile to push that vehicle down the road. Yeah. Okay. So the first and foremost, you've got to make sure that the vehicle still operates because there there are ways to make sure that you know you trickle charge a vehicle. It's it's a term that's used when you've reduced the power of your charger to something very low and you're feeding that kind of energy into your vehicle. We call that trickle charging. You want to be careful because you can trickle charge, which will make sure that you're managing your energy properly, which makes sure that you're not hitting those like peaks uh, for, for your demand. Um, however, if the vehicle isn't ready, then then you're not using it at all. So you're, you're overly reducing the cost of your fuel to the detriment of the operation of the vehicle. So there, there is a sweet spot. There's a, there's a way to be able to determine, um, you know, this vehicle is an express vehicle. It leaves every hour on the hour and we're going to, and that's what, that's what this one does. This one, uh, it, it has a morning route, it has an afternoon route, um, we leave it overnight. So depending on how you're using the vehicle, you can optimize with the utility and the energy that you're drawing from the utility, uh, how much fuel you're putting into the vehicle. Uh, a really good use case for school bus is, let's say you're leaving in the morning with your vision and you've completed your morning route and you've got 60% state of charge, just as an example, after your morning route. Then you've known. Then you know that you've consumed forty percent doing the morning route, and if assuming the afternoon route's the same, now you're about to ask yourself the question: Do I fuel this thing? Fuel. Um, and 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 this is this is an age-old question, right? Uh, if I fuel now, it, it's the energy of the midday, and energy midday tends to be pretty high, pretty expensive, because everybody's kind of at work. The air conditioning systems are running if it's a hot day, or the heating systems are running if it's a winter day. Um, so that becomes pretty pricey. However, if you don't fuel it, then you know that, well, if I take another 40% off the state of charge, I'm coming back at 20. And then I have to charge not just 40, but 80%. However, it's overnight. So the rate overnight is cheaper than during the day. So this is the kind of balance and optimization that you're looking for in your infrastructure, because you, you want to make sure that you're making the right call for the bus, for the route, for the time of day. So you can think through it and decide after you looked at those use profiles, right? What can I actually do to make that use profile less expensive or better for my operation? 
Talk to me a little bit about, I keep hearing about these batteries, the, the batteries as a service or batteries for storage or battery systems that are stationary. Uh, I know they're fairly expensive, right? But what, what would, how would that help us optimize if we had uh, infrastructure for a fleet of buses? Um, the, the, the best way to think of a battery unit is, is resiliency. Um, a battery unit that's able to charge a fleet of buses ends up being quite a big battery energy storage system. And those tend to get really, really pricey. Um, so the best use case for a battery right now would be, uh, to, to, to drop one in, connect it to a charge pack in a way where, uh, let's say there is a power failure. It then drains itself to be able to, to power your most critical routes right away. Um, unless of course you're oversizing it and you're taking every, you know, your 196 kilowatt hour battery and you're multiplying it by 20. And then that's the size of the battery. That's a, that's quite a big boy. So you, you, you don't want to, you don't want to be able to, um, you, you don't, uh, uh, that's a lot of money, I think. Uh, so think of it more as, as resiliency and, you know, we've had some crafty installations where operators opted to put like a solar panel on top of the battery in such a way where you're charging it off grid so you're not this it's like free energy almost and what's cool about the school bus application is that from friday night to monday morning well they're not really going anywhere which means that your resiliency or your backup power tends to fill up uh so it, it's almost like a like a renewable backup energy source that would replace let's say a, an on-site generator so you're saying that even that battery storage and energy storage is scalable. So it's something that I may not necessarily have to buy something that can recharge all 20 buses out of a single large battery pack, right? I might be able to just optimize by having energy flow in and flow out to be able to make me feel more comfortable that that buffer's there. Absolutely. And and it doesn't have to be a decision you can make day one. You know, most of the sites that we work with all, always have like a, a, a natural gas or a diesel generator that's present. And that's usually sufficient for backup. But, you know, as a clean tech company, you want to migrate towards cleaner solutions. So um, you can you can calibrate your expectations of energy used based on what your gas and diesel generators are doing today and then size a battery accordingly. So you're, you touched on something that's unique about when I fill my vehicle with gas or diesel, it's gas or diesel flowing through a pump and liquid going into a tank. And you mentioned a generator. Well, that's not the grid powering these buses. Then this is actually, you know, a gas or diesel or propane or natural gas powered generator that's that's putting the energy in. Mm -hmm. Can I take just about any, yeah, and you mentioned solar panel on the top of uh, battery storage. Can I take just about any, any energy input and put it into this this battery bank and or into these buses? Uh, yeah, yes and no. You have to be careful because um, theoretically uh, we should be able to accept all kinds of energy sources. Certain energy sources are, like need to be converted, need to be treated better. Uh, you can't just plug and play or, or pug, plug and pray, I should say. Uh, I th there, there's, there needs to be a planning, right? So like solar direct into a, a vehicle is, is not a thing, right? Solar goes into batteries, batteries go into uh, a, a switch gear, and then that goes into your chargers, which goes into... So there, there, there are, with proper planning, proper engineering, um, you know... Yeah, anything could be done. So it sounds like you got the potential, but you got to have all the components that are needed to take advantage of that potential. So you could you could potentially have an optimized uh, situation where you're powering these buses and continually displacing those petroleum and you know gaseous fuel consuming generators with some other renewable source. Well, absolutely, we had an interesting project with a flywheel. Never seen that before, but it's just proof in the pudding, right? You can take anything. A flywheel storage is, uh, is, it's an interesting aspect and it's wow. generating something, right? You just got to have the right ability to be able to change it into, like you were saying, the, the correct voltage and amperage and frequency to be able to- That's right. To the device. That's right. So uh, optimizing could also mean optimizing my charger sizes for my fleet. Uh, talk a little bit about as my fleet expands and builds out, uh, you know, what, it, what does that look like? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, like we we touched on this in a in a previous discussion where we can, like, sixty to eighty kilowatts is kind of a like the maximum zone of a school bus, right? Um, but do you want to be the the operator that just slaps on eighty kilowatt units and call it a day? Uh, you know, maybe if you're feeling anxious and if you don't know if it's going to work and you know you have no backup or support system, 
but on the utility side, that's that's a disastrous application. You know, you you want to be able to right size them, you want to be able to scale them. Um, so you have to plan things out. Like what what we normally do is we we enter like a an, an engineering uh, cycle where we look at what the site has, we we look at the available space, we look at the operational flow of the buses. Let's say they come in from the north, they come out from the east or whatnot. We don't want to put like chargers in the way and when we're forecasting what the future would look like, is it back to back? Is it along the fence? Is it so we've got to plan out like civil, make sure that works out, and then electrical, right? So think of the site as like they, they have a dedicated entrance from the utility, right? It goes to the building, it powers the lights, it does everything that it does. Um, well, where is that? Um, how far am I running, you know, copper? Because that has a limit too, right? Um, where am I placing my my distribution solution? Um how far is the furthest charger from that solution? Because you don't want to have a, a, a voltage problem at the end because it's traveled so far that it, like he barely sees anything at that end, right? So, so all of this planning, um, I mean, we do internally, but we also we also encourage everybody to just have a sense, you know, and and it doesn't require too much uh, investment. It gives you all the answers you need. And then once you have those answers, you can ask, you know, your constituents, your board, whoever, all, any stakeholder, really to to validate and approve the plan. So the plan sounds like it really has some possibilities for optimizing even after you've gone down the road a bit if you plan properly. <laughs> yeah, you have to plan for this scale. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that's coming more into scope as we deploy more vehicles is what's called preconditioning the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's taken, obviously, you know, when you're talking about optimization for infrastructure, that's taken its its meaning on depending upon where the bus is at, where it's running, what the temperatures are, what, what sort of dwell time it has. Um, talk to me a little bit about infrastructure that is suited for, uh, or better suited for preconditioning. Do I need to get the bigger is better? Do I need to go with 100 kilowatt or 80 kilowatt, even though the bus only takes no. 60? No, no. Is it? Because, you know... Twofold, right? If you if you get the 100 kilowatt charger, what ends up happening is that you've paid for 20 kilowatts that you'll never use. So, I mean, if you want to throw that money away, sure, you know, but I don't think that's the best way of doing it. Preconditioning is actually uh, a, a very hot topic in Canada uh, or, or cold topic. Either way. Uh, either way. It's definitely a cold topic. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, you want to you want to get that bus cabin warm. You want to get it ready. You when the, when the driver comes in, you want the windows defrosted. You want all that stuff, right? So, um so there's a way, you know, on your infrastructure to start the charge remotely to be able to get that bus to temperature. And the good news is, is that when the, the charger is already plugged into your bus, it doesn't take away the battery energy. It goes straight from grid, which is great because that way you're not eroding your state of charge before the bus even leaves. So you still get the same mileage that you're expecting, um, except now in a warm bus. And it's much more demanding on infrastructure to get the bus to temperature than it is to maintain temperature. So really all that kilowatt that is that would drain normally your battery, if you're getting it to temperature, is actually taken from the grid. So the maintenance throughout the route is uh, is is where you're, you're actually saving. Yeah, so once you've got it up to a nice warm temperature, in the case of Canada, then it's e a lot easier for that bus to be able to keep doing that as it's going down the road. That's right. Including the battery, right? Even in our case, the thermal management system, the battery has to keep that battery Right around 25 Celsius is what it likes to be, just like we do. But that's a you know, so very, very super interesting. As as districts are thinking initially about putting infrastructure in, optimization should be in the back of their mind. What things should they consider? If hey, I haven't got it started yet, but I know I'm going to crawl and put some things in, and then I want to optimize. What items are really important for them to future proof against? Is it is it just putting in additional conduit? Is it planning for additional panels? What 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 kind of things would you think about if you were just getting started but knew you were gonna optimize as you as you move down the path? Right. So I'm a big fan of bite sizing things. So uh if if it's one bus and it's your pilot, uh maybe just plug it into your building for now. And the and there's there's not much really to to do. Uh enjoy it, run it, learn how it goes. Uh, but then when you're getting into a size where your building isn't able to accept it, at that point, you've got to stop and take a step back, right? Because if you're going to put something in that's that's not able to take your entire fleet or or maybe even half of it, then you're 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 stuck with that infrastructure basically forever. These things are made to last. So once you've done it once, ideally, you don't rip it out a couple of years later because these things are, you know, 20, 30, 40, 70 years sometimes, you know, transformers that hang out. 
they they do <laughs> yeah so uh so so a couple of things that you got to look at in terms of scaling so infrastructure needs to scale you need to be able to to have a proper utility rates uh that can accommodate the scaling you got to make sure your utilities on board you got to make sure that you have the available power um yeah i think that those are pretty much the hottest topics so so thinking about somebody that when they got started on this path, they contacted the utility, the utility looked at it and said, yeah, you can support, let's say their fleet is 50, they have 50 buses in a yard. The utility comes out and says, yeah, once you get to about the 20th bus, you're going to have to, you know, potentially go all the way back to the substation with the new feed, new transformers, all that. That versus creative solutions on optimizing with what they already have power coming in. Is there the potential that they could probably expand with just the existing infrastructure? I know, I know batteries are possible. Is there, is there ways to to scale that, to be able to expand a fleet without having a huge investment on the, on the utility side? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the tricky part about utility is that they don't speak transporter and transporter doesn't speak utility. So uh, it would be very rare for a utility to say, well, after your 20th bus, it's not going to work because like they don't know what they're doing with the bus. So once you have a plan in place and you're able to say to your utility, well, look, this is what it's going to look like for phase one, phase two and phase three. You'll need like some kind of translator that will able to that, that is able to like speak utility to say to them, well, this is the load profile of phase one. This is what the load looks like for phase two. Um, chances are they're going to energy optimize. So we're not sizing for the full load. We're sizing, let's say, maybe for like 70% of the load because they want to be cautious with the rates and they don't want to start like generating peaks for themselves. Um, and then once that happens, then a utility is able to fully grasp like, okay, you've, uh, you've translated the use case into a language I understand. Now I'm able to tell you year three is going to be a problem, for example. Okay, well, what does that mean when year three is going to be a problem? So we have to start taking baby steps to be able to say, okay, well, if your year three is a problem and you have one megawatt or two megawatts of power, or some utilities use amperage. So it's like a thousand amps, 2000 amps of power. Um, well, what is it, what's it going to take to be three? Uh, and certain states have these mandates where they need to have, um, you know, all of their fleet or partially partial by, by a certain date. So now is when these things start to need to be planned. And it starts to be where you, you start to bump up against what are we going to do next? But it sounds like there's at least some options out there to be able to use what you have and, and be able to hit low chair and, and, and add some potential batteries into the system. Oh, for sure. When it comes to optimizing, uh, you hear a lot about this NACS standard for connecting. As you're putting in infrastructure and you're optimizing, there's a lot of individual saying, hey, I'm going to have some of these J1772 connections, but I'm also, as soon as this NACS is available, I'm going to spec some of those. Uh, thoughts on that as far as optimizing for future proofing on connecting to the vehicle? Um, I think the NACS standard is is not a medium and heavy duty vehicle standard. I think it's more like of a light duty vehicle standard. Um, I'm only saying that due to the 500 volt like output maximum. Um which tends to be tough on on like the larger bluebirds like the one here. Um, so I think it's great for cars. I think it's what we definitely need for 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 these regular everyday personal vehicles. Um, it might even be good also for the microbird. Uh, but when it comes to the visions and anything bigger than that, um, I don't I don't think right now it'll it'll work or it'll cut it. So J seventeen seventy two CCS one here for a long time in this segment in the market. Oh hell yeah. And that's a bird's eye view on optimization of your EV ecosystem. I'm Brad Beauchamp, EV segment leader at Bluebird.